right, so um, I'm going to focus on carnivore nutrition, and although I'm going to emphasize the cheetah really, uh, you know, it does apply to pretty much all the carnivores, at least the carnivores that eat, you know, uh, I mean, we'll see that there, there are many different, you know, pandas, for example, or carnivore was supposed to be, you know, within the carnivora, but they actually eat a completely different diet. Some of the civets, uh, you know, in, in South America, the the um, maned wolf and so on, I mean, they have very, very different diets. They're not true carnivores. But the true carnivores, um, that, that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on more than anything else. And I'm going to focus on the, on the cheetah because, for me, it is one of the animals that is most sensitive to dietary changes. So what you see in the cheetah can be reproduced, uh, I believe, in a lion or in a leopard. Okay, you just got to push those guys a lot more harder. You've got to create an environment where um, you really, you know, deplete them of certain nutrients before they actually manifest. But they will manifest exactly the same way as with a cheetah. And it's not difficult to understand why. I mean, just from the start, you need to understand that um, as humans or as herbivores or omnivores, you know, you're going to eat a very varied diet. Um, it's going to change dramatically seasonally. And I think part of our problem as humans uh, today is that we eat a very consistent diet. Uh, we don't actually go through actual periods of proper fa fasting. Um, we don't go through, you know, if we ate fruit uh, way back when, it would have been only for a short period of time when the fruit was actually uh, in season. And then we would go, go back to, you know, then we put a lot of fat on and then we would burn that fat as we go through leaner periods, you know, when other food is not available. But we have to have the mechanisms in order to be able to chop and change like that. The galagos that are, or the, the bush babies that I described are quite extreme. You know, they can also switch between these different food sources. And that means they've got to have a lot of systems involved in their body to be able to regulate um, and turn things on and turn things off. And one of the, the, the easiest examples I give is sodium chloride salt. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on as well. But uh, if you think of carnivores, they don't sort of go and pick a cat. It doesn't go and find a high salt mouse and a low salt mouse. Okay, um, mice have the same amount of sodium chloride in their bodies because they have homeostatic mechanisms inside the body that regulate the salt intake. Um, so um, if you think that if all you ever eat is mice, then you won't need all these regulatory systems within your body to be able to control the salt intake um, as well as the salt excretion. All right? And whereas other animals have very, very detailed ways of doing that, um, we're going to talk a little bit about gorillas, for example, and humans too. We have a salt appetite. So if, you, if you're if you depleted of sodium chloride over a long period of time, you will suddenly start craving salt. Okay. Um, if you eat too much salt in one go, your body will simply excrete the excess amount of salt all right, in the urine. In a cheetah, that's not always possible because they don't have such... They, they've got rid of all of those mechanisms because they don't need them. They don't need ways of regulating salt intake because they wouldn't, as I said need them. And it's a waste in terms of having all these pathways available to you uh, physiologically if you don't ever use them. All right? That means you're uh, applying energy to, to things that, that um, are unnecessary. So over evolutionary time, they've managed to just get rid of them. That makes them particularly vulnerable to any changes that you suddenly uh, make in terms of their diet. So for example, if you don't give them enough salt in their diet, they would have a real problem because they would simply waste salt. They wouldn't have much of a way of conserving it. They do, in fact, try and conserve it, but it's not as effective. All right, so that's why we're going to sort of deal with them, but um, as I said, it does apply to many of the other carn carnivore species. Now, uh, I talked a little bit about this. I, said, I mentioned that they have a number of diseases um, in captivity. We've got here, right at the top there, lymphoplasmacytic gastritis, glomerular sclerosis, which is a disease of the kidneys, Venoocclusive disease of the liver, renal amyloidosis, lymphoid depletion of the spleen, adrenal hyperplasia, pancreatitis. Um, have myelopomas in the in the liver and in the spleen. They have cardiac fibrosis, and then a whole bunch of neurological diseases like encephalomyelopathy, leukoencephalopathy, and even Alzheimer's disease. They're probably one of the only species that um, we've actually seen all the characteristics of Alzheimer's disease. A study done in Japan where they looked at um, the brains of cheetahs that had died you know, from captive uh, facilities in Japan. And all of those you know, uh, characteristics of Alzheimer's disease present in the cheetah. All right. No other animal that, are, you know, other than possibly experimental um, animals where they've induced Alzheimer's disease, these rats and mice. Uh, but other than that, any other than kind of naturally occurring Alzheimer's disease, this is the only other species. And it would be the cheetah over anything else. You know, they, 
They seem to be susceptible to anything. <laughs> All right, and, and if you look at some of these diseases, I've, I've um, highlighted lymphocytic or lymphoplasmacytic gastritis and glomerular sclerosis. It's probably too small for you to see there, but let me just see if we you know, get that. Um, these are the, uh, the actual numbers from captive South African cheetahs and then the captive North American cheetahs. Um, and if you look at those first two diseases, um, you can see that we have 99% um, of animals affected both in South Africa and in North America, and then glomerular sclerosis, 83% in, in both countries as well. So very, very high incidence of those actual disease. Now, it doesn't mean that these animals were all sick or clinically um, you know, had these problems. Both lymphoplasmacytic gastritis and glomerular sclerosis can be completely subclinical. You might not see anything at all. But these, these, this was based on post-mortem samples. So all of the, virtually all of those cheetahs that were um, examined on post-mortem had some degree of those diseases present. Um, so it's clearly something that um, is, uh, you know, affecting most of them. Can the herds have contrast to wild cheetahs? Yes. So uh, almost totally the opposite. So we see very few of these things in wild cheetahs, but at the same time, we don't get a lot of wild cheetahs uh, for post-mortems. Um, now with our metapopulation in South Africa, we, we know most of the cheetahs. I mean, they're not completely free-ranging. We, we, you know, they have identified individuals um, in a small reserve. If they do die, we will often do a post-mortem on them. But we hardly ever find any of these issues uh, in those animals. It's less than 10% of them are affected by that. Um, and we'll discuss a little bit of that. So over time, there have been three main theories on this. One is the genetic theory, um, the, and then the stress theory, and then finally the nutrition one. Now, the genetic theory... I mean, the cheetah is the prime example, really, of this inbreeding depression. Um, Steve O'Brien, who'd done a lot of work on cheetah genetics, uh, starting in the 1980s, um, wrote this the book, The Tears of the Cheetah, and um, described the bottleneck that they went through, you know, uh, thousands of years ago, all right, and how inbred they are as a, a species in general. The only problem with that, as, and they then, you know, tried to use that as an explanation as to why they have... Um, these diseases in captivity. Now, there's some truth in that, um, as I've mentioned, because they're highly specialized animals. They have a very specialized diet. Um, but it wasn't the entire explanation, because if we looked at the genetic variability of wild cheetahs in southern Africa and we looked at the captive cheetahs, there was no difference. Okay, heterozygosity was almost identical in the two populations, and yet we don't see the problem in the wild cheetahs, and yet we're seeing all these problems in the captive cheetahs. So it wasn't a... Um, a good explanation of why these uh, animals were having the problems. In sort of the early 2000s, the whole stress theory came um, to fore, and um, it was Corin Terrio, a pathologist in North America, who published a paper in 2004 in which he showed differences between captive cheetahs um, with their adrenal glands. Again, this was a post-mortem study, which is kind of part of the problem um, mostly cheetahs are studied at post-mortem rather than actually in real life. But um, these were zoo cheetahs, uh, you know, many zoo cheetahs that had these very, very large adrenal glands. And obviously adrenal glands related to stress, so enlarged adrenal glands. You know, um, they're also able to demonstrate that, you know, they had uh, higher fecal glucocorticoids. Um, and these smaller normal adrenal glands were from uh, cheetahs, from uh, free-ranging cheetahs from Namibia. The problem that we had with this was that when I uh, did ultrasound examinations of captive cheetahs in Namibia, all right, they had very similar adrenal glands on ultrasound to the wild cheetahs. Okay, so um, this appeared to me to be more like a problem in North American zoos rather than a problem in for captivity per se. So, I mean, the differences in terms of captivity, obviously you can have a zoo environment where you have visitors um, coming to visit these animals every day. Um, captive situation in uh, Namibia where the animals are captive, but they don't ever really see anyone other than their keepers, you know, who feed them. But they're still being fed, um, and they, they still have gastritis, and, and they may have normal adrenal glands. So the stress theory is still continues, and I still have many colleagues that still believe that the stress issue is a big problem. Um, one of my PhD students recently just finished her PhD on looking at different stresses. What are the different things that cause stress to, to cheetahs in captive environment? And at one facility uh, where you come from, Kango, uh, we've done some. We have interactions between um, uh, visitors and uh, captive reared or hand reared cheetahs, 
and we wanted to see does that actually cause any stress to these animals. We also wanted to see if we change the feeding frequency, which we're going to talk a little bit about. How, you know, if we move them from being fed six days a week down to four days a week, and they're going to have you know two extra starve days per week, are we going to cause stress to the animals? And then we looked at also um, just looking at behavioral enrichment. Does it actually decrease stress or increase stress to the animals? We tried a whole different kind, uh, different kinds of enrichment. And then finally, she also looked at proximity of uh, cheetahs to other large carnivores. If we had them in enclosure next to the lions, did that cause any stress to them? Now, these were all hand-reared captive animals. Um, so it may not apply to animals that are parent-reared. Uh, but absolutely, I can say that looking at the data across the board, virtually nothing stressed those cheetahs out. Um, there actually seemed to be a little bit of an excitement uh, that occurred, and you know we saw an increase in their heart rates when they were um, exposed to people they didn't know. But if we look at the glucocorticoids, the fecal glucocorticoids, they didn't change much at all uh, for any of those experiments. Um, so the idea that they are chronically stressed, um, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, one of the, the things is that most animals will adapt. You put them in an environment, even if it's a, you know, if there's some level of stress in that environment, over time they adapt to that environment. Um, and when you look at these cheetahs, what they're getting is progressively worse over time. You know, in terms of the diseases to the, the, the problems in the stomach, the problems in the kidneys, they're just getting worse. Right? So if that were the case, if stress was a major issue, then these animals are really maladaptive. They're really not able to adapt to that environment. Um, so it certainly to me didn't seem to be a, a real uh, plausible explanation for the, all these diseases that have in captivity. There have been a few studies um, by some other um, researchers on a diet, and um, although these, now, and these are already getting quite old already, um, but also raising the issue of potential diet issue, dietary issues, and I'm going to discuss those in a little bit more detail as we go on. All right, so just in terms of um, wild cheetah prey preference, this is quite important um, to understand. They eat 95% of their diet. Unlike leopards, leopards will eat almost anything they can find. Um, and they, uh, you know, from small birds, uh, they will eat um, guinea fowl, they will eat warthogs. Um, they, you know, some of them actually even like warthog meat, even though a warthog is actually a really difficult animal to kill. Um, these leopards will grab them and just basically chew on them until they bleed out. You know, they, they, it's very difficult to grab them by the throat and actually suffocate them. Um, but a cheetah would never be able to really do that. So the cheetahs will take small um, warthogs, young warthogs, but they really won't be able to take an, an adult warthog. Um, and so most of the prey that they focus on are small antelope, and that, you know, as you'll see, becomes very, very important. Right? So a very specific diet. Um, if we look at the actual makeup of the of a carcass, obviously it's not just muscle meat. About 50% of the carcass will be muscle meat, but then other things, the skin, bones, the internal organs. And another important thing is that because cheetahs are mostly solitary, they will eat the entire carcass themselves. All right? Very different from a lion pride, where individuals in the pride are going to be feeding on different carcass components. And so, for example, a young sub-adult might get a piece of liver from a buffalo that the pride is eating this time round. But um, next time the hunt it may not have access to the liver at all and may have to you know, only have a muscle meat uh, diet on that particular occasion. So that, you know, you'd ex then expect the lion to be a little bit more robust. It must be able to store the nutrients for longer periods of time than the cheetah. Uh, cheetah, because it's getting the same diet every single time, it's going to have less um, adaptability to changes in that diet. All right, so just to point out that antelope, small antelope, are ruminants, and that becomes quite an important component of the, of the diet as well. So ruminant has got four stomachs, very different to a monogastric animal uh, in terms of how they metabolize food, and um, particularly in terms of the fats that we will find. So ruminants, I'm um, going to talk a lot about fat digestion in a moment, but ruminants have these microbes in the rumen that are able to transform polyunsaturated fats into saturated fats. Right, and saturated fats, as you may know, um, are really stable fats. Polyunsaturated fats have a lot, lot of double bonds, and the longer the chain of polyunsaturated, the more and the more double bonds they have, um, the more unstable they, come, they, they become, and they are oxidized very easily. Right? And that's going to be a fairly important thing that we're going to be discussing in a moment. Okay. In captivity, uh, what we end up with often is this kind of scenario 
where the large proportion of the diet is actual muscle meat. And it's understandably so, because when you, we have a lot of horses that um, obviously are euthanized at some stage, old racing horses, show jumpers, whatever, you know, and then their carcasses are donated to various facilities. And it becomes a very cheap form of food, very good source of, of potential food. But if you compare the size of the animal that the, I mean, a cheetah would normally hunt, would be a fairly small animal, compared to a horse, right now, it immediately creates a bit of a problem. Um, those animals are often skinned, they are exsanguinated, so the skin, the blood is removed. Um, internal organs don't last very long. Um, you, you know, you'd have to freeze them quite quickly after they've um, been um, purchased or obtained. And um, so often they are discarded as well, and all you've got really is the, the, the carcass as we would see in a butcher or whatever. Um, and uh, then that is cut up. Okay. The animals cannot cope with a large femur bone from a horse. I mean, most of the cheetahs will never, ever be able to break that up into smaller pieces um, and uh, consume it. So they will eat all the meat off the bone. All right. So very few of the actual bones are, are consumed. And so you can see, and then we have just some blatant ignorance in South Africa. I mean, often we have uh, the biggest problem. We have hand-reared animals that um, are weaned off the um, replacement milk replacer and put straight onto mincemeat. As a, as a diet, and that creates problems within a very short space of, of time. All right, are we any questions at this stage? Quite happy with it. Okay, right. I'm going to use this. Um, uh, it's a little bit small, the writing on this, uh, but it, it 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 illustrates some of the adaptations to strict carnivory, um, and it uses a dog as an example, which I think is really quite interesting because. Um, as many of our pet food companies will try to uh, persuade us that the dog is a omnivore. Um, the only reason I believe that they're really trying to persuade you that the dog is an omnivore is because they sell food that contains a large amount of carbohydrates, and um, it wouldn't be very convincing if they told you that uh, you know their food is completely inadequate okay, for, a, for, a, for a strict carnivore. The reason I would say that simply is because dogs evolved from the wolf. Um, all of our dog breeds pretty much come from, from the wolf. And the wolf, if we look at their diet, I mean, about 3% uh, of their diet is carbohydrates, and I don't think that is specifically that they are targeting uh, berries or anything else. Um, like domestic dogs, anybody who's owned a dog will know that they go out and eat grass, okay, and that's normal. Um, I don't believe that the grass plays any functional role in terms of nutrition. They're not absorbing anything from the grass. It plays more of an important role in the actual colon where it's changes the bacterial makeup of the, of the colon and helps them with some, as, those, some of those aspects of, of um, managing the, the colonic bacteria. All right. But um, if there are some ad adaptations in the domestic dog towards uh, glucose metabolism, and um, they, they certainly are better than the wolf in terms of a very small amount uh, of, of improvement, shall we say, or adaptation to a, a diet that is uh, higher in carbohydrates. But if we look at everything else in terms of the, and I'm just going to point them out here. I don't have a pointer here, but um, so the in orange they have traits that are very similar to the cats. Um, cat recognized um, or carnivore, and again, cat foods contain about 40% carbohydrates, so that's also still a bit of an interesting one. All right, so the carnassial teeth in the back of the mouth, I mean, are mainly made for shearing of meat. Um, there are no flat surfaces. We as humans have flat teeth. Again, indicating that we, they're there to be able to grind plant material uh, to some extent. Okay, we have a variety of teeth in the mouth, so we would probably we would definitely classify it as omnivores. Um, they are unable to move the jaw from side to side, so it only really moves up and down. There's no horizontal movement, so they can't actually grind uh, plant material. The, the canines obviously there for catching prey uh, and holding on to prey. The taste senses in the um, mouth, in the tongue, are, are mainly geared towards amino acids and uh, nucleotides and not towards sugars. Um, so again, indicating that they are um, carnivores. They have no salivary amylase. Uh, the vitamin A is transported in the blood as retinal esters, okay, which means they have actually got an enormous tolerance to very high levels of vitamin A in the diet because they can basically, as you see on this side, also excrete vitamin A uh, in the actual urine as retinal esters. They have a very short intestine, all right, um, because they've got a very high quality diet. Um, and then they have a, a, a stomach that can expand tremendously, all right, um, to 
consume an entire, I mean, I, I, one cheetah now that we had in, in India, um, in one of the Bomas, they consumed uh, 15 kilograms of goat meat in one setting. All right, that's, you know, if you had to think of a 15 kilogram steak, uh, you know, that would be, a kilogram steak is, is overwhelming for us. You know, um, so they are able to expand, so you go through this feast and fast cycle, um, which is, is quite interesting. And then um, in gray, it's the only thing, the increased capacity for glycogen, starch digestion, and glucose uptake. So that's a slight adaptation. But everything else um, in terms of that feast and fast cycle, the stomach that it can expand, the stomach pH that is goes down to approximately, we're going to talk a lot about stomach uh, acid in um, this talk as well, but um, goes down to a pH of around 2, sometimes even lower, 1.5. Right, so clear sign, and, and that is mainly for protein digestion. So a lot of uh, those are the adaptations to pure carnivory that um, you need to sort of be, be aware of. And again, I've, as I said, um, just um, be and argue that the, the dog really, there are very few indications that it will really be able to um, adapt to a very high carbohydrate diet. So just in, interesting in why, 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 why do these food companies put carbohydrates into a diet? Well, it's because if you want to make a biscuit, um, that is going to have any sort of shelf life, something that you don't have to keep in a freezer or a fridge, all right? You, you, anybody who bakes um, will know that, I mean, in South Africa we have rusks, which are really dry biscuits, okay, that you can keep on the shelf um, for months, all right? And the reason you can do that is you dry them out completely um, after baking them, and then they have a long shelf life. Uh, the same thing with uh, with dog biscuits. Okay, you need a certain amount of carbohydrate, though. You can't make a rusk or you can't make a, a biscuit without um, some sort of flour or carbohydrate. Um, so if you try to just use proteins and fats, okay, first of all, it wouldn't bake, and it's, 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 you know, you'd have to you'd dry it out intensely, and it would become a real problem um, in terms of shelf life. So that's why they make these large bags of dog food. All right. And um, so it's not, not ideal. Now, I'm not, I mean, I'll, I can give you a lot of information about raw diets. I feed my own dogs raw, raw diets. It's not something that's very easy to try and, if you want to make a lot of mistakes, you can, I mean, you try and advise somebody about doing it. Um, I would be very, very careful of doing that because, as I said, you know, you can end up with major nutrient deficiencies. If you don't know what you're doing, um, you have to feed basically whole carcasses. Again, same principles apply to the cheetah or whatever, any, any other carnivore. All right, and that can be very difficult because you go down to the butcher down the road and they will nef not necessarily have all of those components and which ones are more important and which ones not. Um, the person needs some sort of background in nutrition uh, before they will be able to feed their own dog um, and have some idea of what they should be feeding the dogs unless you make it up uh, properly. So I don't normally recommend that unless uh, it's easier to just provide some sort of dog food that you know is relatively well balanced, but in terms of the longevity of that animal um, and what those carbohydrates are going to do to the animal and to its digestion, we, you know, there's a lot of um, things that I can talk about. Gastric dilatation volvulus, okay, um, a big problem in, in large breed dogs, okay, has got nothing to do with the actual exercise after they've had a large meal or anything like that. It's got to do with maldigestion, uh, maldigestion syndrome in those animals and gas production from fermentation that takes place because of the maldigestion because they're getting a lot of carbohydrates in the, in the diet. Same with um, other little dogs. Uh, you get this HGE, which is hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. It's got a new name now. It's uh, something hemorrhagic diarrhea. But they, little dogs, often Yorkshire Terriers and so on, that end up getting this really bloody diarrhea. And um, that almost always is associated also with an abnormal diet where they're getting a lot of treats from the, from the owners, often a lot of high carbohydrate treats. And they end up with this clostridial overgrowth which then causes a major, major problem and repeated problem. Anyway, so we can talk a lot about domestic dogs, but that's not really what we hear about. Okay, so I'm going to just go through the fat digestion first, and then we'll take a, a tea break. Okay, fat, really, really important um, component of the diet, and uh, I wanted to sort of mention that actually it's one of the most the easily digested parts of the diet. It's also, the, if we look at in terms of inflammatory conditions, proteins are problematic. Um, in terms of digestion, fat is virtually never a problem. Okay, never a problem in terms of causing allergies, never really a problem in terms of uh, being pro-inflammatory, unless you eat a lot of polyunsaturated fats, which are oxidized, then you, you potentially could have a problem with inflammation. But they are a very important part of the, of the diet. I've had quite a, f a few, I mean, if you read some of uh, uh, certain, people won't mention any names, but... Um, who still re recommend when they're ch feeding cheetahs to go and meticulously remove the fat. Um, and the reason why they are very concerned about fat is because there's this idea that fat 
uh, actually feeding too much fat can cause pancreatitis in cheetahs. Now, if you have a cheetah with pancreatitis, then you might have a problem with feeding them high fat diet. But the fat is not the thing that causes the pancreatitis in the first place. Right? And uh, we have many fat soluble vitamins, which we're going to talk about, like vitamin A, vitamin E. Those things are not absorbed if you don't have fat in the actual diet. So it really becomes very important that we don't remove the excess fat, otherwise we end up with just a, like almost pure protein diet, which has you know, also got its problems. All right, so fat digestion. Um, we have these fat globules. It's a little bit of a problem to get the fat um, to be digested properly. So we produce bile, bile salts. So that's the whole function of bile, is to be basically attach to the fat globules, which then makes it more water soluble and allows many of the digestive enzymes to attach to those fat globules to break them up into smaller uh, fat, um, fatty acids, free fatty acids, and then the bile salts uh, uh, enable that to be absorbed into the actual enterocytes inside the actual um, gut. And then from there they're transported through um, the, the lacteal system, right? they don't go straight into the bloodstream um, because fat can't really be dissolved in the blood, and blood is you know, a water-based um, medium. Um, so they're then transported uh, by the lymph to, uh, and uh, we won't go into too much detail about fat transport, but um, that is you know, probably, the, it's a very efficient system and, and very well, uh, as long as you're producing a certain amount of bile, you can digest fats um, very well. You need a, a functional pancreas, obviously, because many of the lipases are produced by the pancreas. So um, if you don't, if you've got some sort of pancreatic problem, you may not be able to digest fats uh, adequately. But in most cases, this is not really a, a major problem. So this is part of my PhD study where um, I basically looked at the fatty acid composition of cheetahs, wild cheetahs, and so I took blood samples from wild cheetahs and blood samples from captive cheetahs. And then we analyzed the fatty acids that were present in the blood, being transported in, in the blood in various different ways. And that um, is really interesting because it is a reflection of what, largely a reflection of what they're actually eating, um, you know, in terms of the fat intake. All right. So fatty acids, there are a whole range of them. I've already mentioned that you get saturated ones, you get monounsaturated fatty acids, which um, only have a single double bond. And then you get, uh, obviously, polyunsaturated fats, uh, which have multiple double bonds, and um, there you get the omega 3s and omega 6s. You'll have heard of all of those before, and they can be very in chain length. So you can measure all of these different types of fatty acids in the blood and then get a fairly good idea of what those animals are actually eating in the wild. And what I want to just point out here if you know anything about research and, and statistics and p values, then you can see that all of these p values, are, 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 or most of them, are really, really low which indicates that they are highly or significantly different between the captive and the free-ranging um, cheetahs. Um, it was like chalk and cheese, okay? Uh, I just want to make sure. All right, just, okay, so the main, I've just got the points to get them all up. Again, it's too small to, to see, but we had 35 captive and 43 free-ranging cheetahs. Um, we looked at the total fatty acid quantified using uh, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. And what we found was that the pupus, or the polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats, significantly were lower in the free-ranging cheetahs. Um, polyunsaturated fats are higher in the uh, captive cheetahs that were e eating mainly at that stage. These were animals that were eating donkey meat, so again, a monogastric animal. And, um, and what we concluded that was that there was a higher risk of oxidative damage because of those polyunsaturated fats being at risk of oxidation. Um, so I just want to show you, I think they are, wait, no, it's going to just, uh, uh, that doesn't allow you to go back. Anyway, so massive difference. So basically your captive cheetahs had very, very high polyunsaturated fat levels and very low saturated fat levels, and the, the, the free-ranging cheetahs were the other way around. Okay, and then it made sense to me to, in a certain sense because, they, as I said, they're hunting ruminants, okay, which have a high saturated fat content. Um, and then I'll explain uh, there are a few other um, explanations I have for that as well. Um, whereas monogastrics, anything like a chicken, a horse, um, anything that's got a single stomach. And then, to be honest, um, if you have a ruminant that is eating mainly a grain-based diet, so a feedlot, a or feedlot cattle that are fed uh, a lot of grain, um, they are also going to um, produce more polyunsaturated fats than, than saturated fats. So grass-fed beef, I mean, that's one of the reasons why they bang on about grass-fed beef, is because it's got saturated fat, 
um, less polyunsaturated fat. Um, so it, in, in that sense, is potentially healthier for, for you. All right, and those saturated fats, you can't, they don't oxidize. There is no double bond to actually oxidize, all right, whereas our polyunsaturated fats are very at risk. So just in terms of polyunsaturated fats, you or might take fish oil supplements. I um, don't if, if it's for the omega-3s. One of the things that they hardly ever tell you um, is that, you know, they sell these big jars of the things, you know, 90 capsules or whatever for three months' worth. And then they, the only thing that they do manage to do is to put them into a dark jar so they protect, protect them against sunlight. But ideally what you should do if you do buy those supplements is to put them in the fridge, okay, because um, they've done an analysis uh, uh, from just a pharmacy that took a whole bunch of these supplements off the shelf in South Africa, and they showed that almost half of those, more than half of them, are already oxid oxidized on the shelf. That's even be before you've taken it home and kept it in the cupboard for three months, all right? So, um, you know, those... Because they are polyunsaturated fats, they need to be protected from oxidation. It's actually worse for you if you go and take them as a supplement when the, the, when the fat is already oxidized. Okay? You're increasing your, the oxidative damage to your body, and you need to then take some sort of antioxidant like vitamin C or something like that to be able to counteract that. Okay? So um, really just to you know, take a message here, and if you're going to give a cheetah um, any of these sort of supplements, I don't, there, there actually is no reason really to do it. But um, if you had a specific deficiency situation, then again, or if a dog, you know, they use them for the skin conditions and various other inflammatory conditions, they give them as a supplement. Again, don't go and buy the biggest jar you can find. Only buy enough for a month, and if you do, keep it in the fridge, you know, so that you reduce the amount of oxidative damage to that. Keep it in a dark place at a cold temperature. That's the, the, the way of preserving or reducing the oxidative damage to those um, polyunsaturated fats. All right, so one of the uh, things that we're going to go into a bit of detail here is the, the two main um, polyunsaturated fats that we find in a lot of food sources um, and fats of the animals that, that uh, are monogastrics is um, the omega-6 one, which is linoleic acid. Okay, it's 18 carbons long. It's got uh, two double bonds. And then you've got um, alpha-linolenic acid, which is the omega-3 form. Um, again, 18 carbons long and three double bonds. All right, so those are the kind of starting points. From those, we get a whole range of um, different fatty acids. Um, some of them like arachidonic acid, which is, you know, you're increasing the chain length, all right, and adding an extra double bond. Arachidonic acid is a very important um, uh, fatty acid that plays a role in inflammation in the body um, and also uh, has a whole range of different functions. And then um, you'll see it down here, uh, right at the bottom over you've got DHA, um, and sort of halfway in the middle over there, EPA. Now, those, DHA and EPA are the two things when you take fish oil supplement that you, that you, the omega-3 fatty acids that you are trying to get. Okay, we've shown in humans that they are really uh, important for multiple different uh, things. Okay, this is just in terms of the fatty acids in the body. Um, besides every single cell membrane in your body, yeah, it's got fatty acids in it, the, the lipid bilayer of every single cell. Okay, so that's the, the structural components. They play an important um, role in uh, all the inflammatory pathways in the body. They play an important role in uh, energy production. So you can produce a lot of energy from beta oxidation in the mitochondria, okay, from fatty acids. And then in hormones, almost every single hormone in the body, um, you know, all the sex hormones and, and so on, uh, all are constructed from, from fatty acids. So fats, again, really becoming a very important part in terms of physiology. Okay, coming back to DHA and EPA, um, those omega-3 fatty acids, they've been shown to be very important in cognitive function, cardiovascular system, for muscle and bone, and as well as immune function. And hence the reason many of us end up taking some sort of fish oil supplement um, in order to be able to get those uh, omega-3. And, um, uh, and then your omega-3 and omega-6 balance is very important too. Omega-6 being more a sort of pro-inflammatory, you do need to be able to have inflammation in your body when it's needed, okay? Um, but at the same time, you need to counteract that. Um, you don't want to have it run away um, and end up with, with chronic inflammation. You want to have it for a short period of time to be able to provide increased blood flow to a particular area to allow for healing to take place, and then you want to stop that inflammation and end it. Okay. And uh, half of our problems, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, whether it's chronic bowel disease or anything like that, are due to runaway inflammation because the inflammation is just not stopping. Um, but now, interesting question to you. I mean, cheetahs in the wild never, ever see a fish. They will never eat a fish. They will never actually 
get an omega-3 supplement. Okay? They're eating virtually no polyunsaturated fats because they're eating ruminants that are, only have saturated fats. Yet they do need EPA and DHA. And the interesting question is, okay, so where do they get them from if they don't? And the, the answer to that is simply that they produce them themselves from the saturated fats. Now, the interesting thing was when I actually measured, I was looking for DHA and EPA in the blood of these wild cheetahs. And uh, interesting thing, we found EPA, to some extent, we found no DHA at all, was not detectable, couldn't find it in the blood. Uh, so that worried me a little bit initially, but obviously they must make it, they do need it. Um, most animals will need it in some form. And then I realized, okay, but it's actually not transported, it's made in the brain itself from the saturated fats, there are mechanisms in which it is, is made. Um, I just want to get, that's a bit of a problem, won't allow you to go backwards. Hmm. Okay, all right. <clears throat> but so the, the very interesting thing is, okay, so yeah, um, ND, uh, you'll see the docosahexanoic acid, DHA, not detected both in the captive and the free-ranging animals, so it wasn't found. All right, so it's made in the brain itself, you will never find it actually in the blood itself, and you, but you don't need to actually suddenly start supplementing it. Um, really not important. So this is just, um, I showed you yeah, the differences between the captive and the wild cheetahs. Arachidonic acid in our, again, this is quite small, so you're not going to see it. That, that wasn't that different. But um, the total omega-6 difference in your captive ones was over 1,000, 1,183. In the free-ranging cheetahs was 357, so less than a third. Um, Okay, if we look at the total polyunsaturated fats, 1,183 and then 363 in the, uh, uh, the free-ranging ones. Um, and then if you look at linoleic acid, uh, it, remember the 18-carbon uh, precursor of most of the um, uh, omega-6 fatty acids that are sitting in the captive ones that are over 1,000, in the free-ranging ones just under 300. There's a massive difference there. And this is what we mentioned before, look, looking at the prey preference, Impala, Blessbuck, Grants, Gazelle, Tommy Gazelle, Springbuck, okay, those are the prey preference, all of them small, antelope, all of them ruminants. Um, just two other things with regards to explanation for why that occurred, besides the fact that they're eating mainly ruminants, is that abdominal and organ fat, so in African species and um, antelope species, most of them store their fat in the abdomen itself, around the kidneys. You know, um, you'll find very little subcutaneous fat. If you go to the northern hemisphere and you look at, at reindeer, um, they store the fat uh, subcutaneously and in the muscles themselves. So it's a lot more marbled. But if you want really lean meat, you, you know, go for any of the antelope species in, in, in Africa. And the main reason for that is because they want heat. Heat loss is, is, is uh, important to many of African species where high temperatures are the, the primary problem. So they're trying to get rid of excess heat. Now, the difference between saturated fat and polyunsaturated fat, polyunsaturated fats are more liquid at room temperature or even at body temperature, whereas saturated fat is more solid, hard. Right? So if you want to run around and you've got saturated fats in your muscles, you're going to find it very difficult to move those muscles around at normal body temperatures. Whereas if you store it inside the abdomen, right, it can be rock solid. It's that hard white fat that you, that you find. It's saturated fat. But it's, it's rock solid. But you can store it in the abdomen because you don't have to run with your abdomen. You can leave it. You know, that's not a problem. So cheetahs preferentially, I mean, when they eat these animals, they often go into the abdomen and they will eat all of the internal organs. They leave the actual rumen. They don't really touch the rumen or the rumen content. They pull out the rumen and they will often even bury it to some extent. And then they will go back in and they will eat all of the internal organs, uh, the kidneys, the spleen. Um, but, but definitely the fat that's in the actual abdomen itself. Now, one of the explanations as to why they don't eat the rumen or the actual intestines is because they are really at risk from other larger predators. And when you bite into that rumen, anyone who's opened a rumen on a post-mortem would know that it has a strong smell. That smell just gets projected up into the atmosphere and will attract uh, you know, some of the other hyenas, spotted hyenas, lions, um, leopards uh, in an instant. So... Um, we think that they do that, you know, to try and stay on the kill as long as possible because they've, only, they've got to eat as, really as quickly as possible as well. All right, so um, <clears throat> they eat, they preferentially target that fat inside the abdomen. All right, so that fat itself is already going to have a high saturated fat content, and that may be one of the reasons why in the wild cheetahs will have a higher saturated fat. The other thing is that during fasting, if you fast for longer periods of time, you preferentially burn up the polyunsaturated fats in your system. 
All right, so fasting would burn up those polyunsaturated fats, and obviously the amount of energy expended by wild cheetahs is much, much greater than captive cheetahs. So again, that may be an additional explanation as to why there's massive differences between what was found in their bloodstream in terms of you know, fatty acids. Okay. All right, so here we're just showing you the peroxidation of um, polyunsaturated fats and some of the things, the enzyme systems and things in the body, glutathione being the main antioxidant that is present in the body, and it is really important um, as the, uh, an antioxidant to counteract any oxidative uh, damage. But now you can imagine if you're an animal that's eating mainly saturated fats and you have very low oxidative pressure, okay, you're not really going to need too many of things, these things. Um, you will need some vitamin E for various other functions, but um, and vitamin C may be important, but obviously they don't eat any fruit or any uh, any plant material that contains vitamin C. Um, so the vitamin C that cheetahs have, they are producing themselves. Okay, they produce a very small amount in their body themselves. There's only a few animal species like uh, humans and guinea pigs that actually don't uh, produce vitamin C and that absolutely need vitamin C in the in the diet. But many of our carnivore species produce it um, naturally. The only problem is when you have a very high oxidative damage uh, due to the ingestion of um, you know, polyunsaturated fats that are oxidized, you need to increase your oxidative uh, or antioxidant potential. And um, that's why in some of the supplements that I produce, I would add vitamin C to the actual supplement as well, um, just to counteract the potential damage for animals that are on chicken diets or, or horse meat diets and so on. All right, but in a normal setting, you wouldn't have to do that. You wouldn't have to add the vitamin C or anything else uh, to the diet. We're just going to talk about glutathione as well because when we get further down the line, um, I'll come back to glutathione because it's what we call the mother of all antioxidants present in every single cell in the body. Really, really important um, uh, in terms of controlling oxidative damage. Um, in humans with asthma, glutathione seems to be a major problem, that the glutathione levels are actually lower than people who don't have asthma. Right? And if you can boost their, their glutathione levels, you can actually to some extent control their asthma symptoms as well. So, fairly interesting one, but we're going to come back to it because um, uh, there's a, every good chance that cheetahs, we, by what we feed them, we damage the, uh, their ability to be able to produce glutathione. And so we're actually hitting them from both sides. We are giving them uh, high polyunsaturated diets, which are obviously prone to oxidation and oxidative damage, and then we are limiting the amount of glutathione that they can produce um, as well. And that's why we, we end up, you know, to some extent, why we could end up with these um, chronic inflammatory conditions. All right, and then one of the other things I just want to show you about, I've shown this in another format already, those two 18-carbon um, uh, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, linoleic acid and linolenic acid, they require a particular uh, enzyme called delta-60 saturase to um, desaturate the uh, and, and form all of these other fatty acids that are necessary in the body for other functions. Right now, in humans, we have a fair amount of this delta-60 saturase, but in cheetahs, we think, and in cats in general, we, all the cat species, they have a very limited amount of delta-60 saturase. Delta-60 saturase is needed for that first reaction, okay, um, to convert alpha-linolenic acid into um, steroidonic acid uh, and, and linolenic acid to uh, gamma-linolenic acid, all right, so that first part of the, of the equation. But then they're also required for this last part right at the bottom over here, um, taking docosapentanoic acid to docosahexanoic acid, or DHA, which I said was really important. It's one where we, we're taking a supplement for that. Now, the problem, and I said this, this whole reaction occurs in the cheetah naturally, uh, and this last reaction over here takes place in the brain. Now, the problem is if you feed a diet that's very high in those uh, initial um, two 18-carbon uh, uh, fatty acids, then what ends up happening is you use all the delta-60 saturase that is present in the body for that first reaction, and you end up with this last reaction not having any delta-60 saturase. So you actually can't produce this last step of the, of the process inside the brain, and you end up with a deficiency of um, DHA in the, in the actual brain. Um, so again, if you feed a saturated f uh, fat with low polyunsaturated uh, fats in the diet, then you'll have enough delta-60 saturase, and you'll still be able to form enough DHA in the brain. If you feed a very high polyunsaturated fat diet, then you're going to use up all of that, and you won't have enough for this last step. Okay. And that's why um, there are the two papers, I, I believe, that have been published now in the 1990s on um, fatty acid deficiencies in cheetahs. 
And uh, then they focus on supplementing the DHA, but not realizing that the problem is not down here. The problem is further up um, you know, in feeding a very high polyunsaturated fatty diet. And if they just fix that, they won't have to supplement um, with any of the fish oils in the diet. Okay, because it makes sense. I mean, as I said, you know, cheetahs don't eat fish. They've never, they never will come across a fish uh, ever in, the, in their life. So, you know, if you just think of it logically, you should you know, eventually come to, to an answer. Okay. So, in summary, really, the carnivores obviously need fat. It's a good source of energy. Um, it's a source of essential fatty acids that play a wide role of, of functions in the body. Um, and that's true for humans, as said, by the way, uh, as well. In a very low-fat diet, has many, many uh, negative effects on the body, besides all the hormones, um, control of inflammation, all of those things. Um, and then you need fat into, in order to be able to absorb the fat-soluble vitamins. So if you don't have it in the diet, you won't be able to absorb very, very important A, D, E, and K. Uh, those vitamins are going to not be absorbed well. All right. Um, but it is the, the ratio of saturated fatty acids to polyunsaturated fat, fatty acids that's really, really important in terms of minimizing cellular damage through lipid peroxidation. And so you, you know, uh, also need a good ratio in order to make sure that you have enough delta-60 saturase activity for DHA production in the end. Okay. Um, there are some differences uh, between lions and cheetahs, perhaps, in terms of their sensitivity to that. Um, which we can discuss, but the basic recommendations here is to feed primarily fat from ruminants rather than from monogastric animals. That's always, I understand, is not always possible, but that's certainly the ideal. Um, definitely want to feed the intra-abdominal fat rather than subcutaneous or muscular fat because it's going to be higher in, in saturated fats. Feed less frequently, basically to allow for better oxidation of the polyunsaturated fats. So again, if you allow animals to go through a bit of a starve period of time, they will start burning up the polyunsaturated fats that are available because they preferentially use them for energy. All right? So they're going to have le less incorporation of those polyunsaturated fats into other tissues in the body. And then if it's not possible, then consider supplementing with vitamin E, vitamin C, DHA, uh, N-acetyl cysteine, which is a precursor of glutathione, uh, or glycine, which I'm going to get to in a, in, a, in a later stage, which is important for the production of glutathione, all right? which we said is the main antioxidant. All right, so, all right, I'm going to leave it at that for now, and then we're going to just have tea, and then we can start on the favorite subject, which is protein digestion. Okay. <laughs>